All right, we will go ahead and get started. Um, so I want to welcome everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you for being here on a Tuesday evening. I hope all of you had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday with your family and friends. Um, unfortunately, Margaret um, is unable to join us tonight. She had a family emergency uh, that came up last minute. So we send her our best. Um, and we are really excited tonight. Um, we have Amanda Neely with us from Wealth Wisdom Financial Partners, and we'll be talking about the topic of infinite banking or bank on yourself. So this is a really interesting, really unique strategy um, that has been around for quite a while and actually is a, a strategy that the ultra wealthy has been utilizing uh, for many, many years, and it's really becoming uh, more of a mainstream. I would say it's it's becoming more. It's still pretty unique in itself, but it's becoming more well known now. Um, so we uh, we're here today to talk about it and about the awesome things that you can do with infinite banking. Um, and we have an expert here with us um, who is a dear friend. And thank you so much for joining us, Amanda. Um, really excited to hear about all that you have to say about infinite banking. <laughs> so um, before we start, there is a disclaimer. Um, just want to mention that the following content is only for informational purposes only and of general nature, everything that's presented on this webinar. So the information shared, conveyed, and elucidated in this presentation is not intended to constitute any legal tax or accounting, financial, or um, investment advice. So any ideas or strategies discussed should not be taken, uh, undertaken by any, any individual without prior consultation, without a financial professional or independent research. So please make your own uh, judgments and certainly do your research. Uh, Amanda is here. Uh, and if you want to schedule a call with her following this to talk more about the topics that we talk about tonight, please, you know, please do do that. And also, if there are any questions that come up, uh, please do put it in the Q&A chat box. And if it is something that we're talking about at the moment, we may address it. Um, otherwise, all questions will be saved to the end for uh, discussions. And we would love to have your engagement. So please, please do ask any questions or even comments, um, ideas that come up anytime. All right. So. I am your host, uh, Christine Shu with Nobly Vest, and also uh, my partner, Margaret Kozlark. So um, Margaret has personally invested as a GPLP fund manager in over, I think now over 2,000 doors across the Sunbelt regions and in Indianapolis or Indiana. And she also holds a real estate uh, license with Keller Williams. And also I own six uh, rental properties across Philadelphia and Westchester, New York. And I'm also a GPLP, JV, and fund manager across multiple syndications, also in the Sun Belt regions, uh, spanning also over 2,000 units. So we're really excited uh, to host this webinar with you as no leave us to our community and really just learn together. So with that, uh, we're here with Amanda Neely, again, from Wealth Wisdom Financial Partners. Um, she is a small business and financial professional. Uh, originally, she can give you her backstory. Um, just a quick run through. Um, she, is, she has a lot of knowledge about uh, small business and financial strategies for personal and business. So um, her and her husband, Brandon, Brandon are partners in crime. And really uh, have helped so many families and couples and individuals really with their uh, financial strategies to build wealth and legacy wealth. So uh, we're really happy to have her here tonight and I will let her introduce herself more in detail. All right. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Christine. It's awesome to be here with you all. Um, would love to hear um, as we're getting started here. I'm going to start sharing my screen. If you would let me know if you're new to infinite banking, if you are already a user of infinite banking, 
you'd consider like you've looked into it, but maybe haven't started anything before, share that in the Q&A or the chat wherever you can find to comment. We'd love to kind of know who the audience is here as I'm getting the slideshow going. And just a heads up at the, um, it, as we go here, we're going to be looking for someone to ask uh, to you win a prize. You get to win a hundred dollars to give to the charity of your choice. Um, I'll ask you what charity I'll go give the donation. I'll let you know that uh, that was done and, you know, give you proof that it was made. So the way to win that hundred dollars for the charity of your choice is to participate in the Q and a participate in the chat ask questions, give feedback. We'd love to hear that for you. And here on Giving Tuesday, you get to help that charity as well. So a um, little bit of background, uh, like Christine said, I started my first business, sold it during that process, found Bank on Yourself for Infinite Banking and adopted it. And it totally revolutionized how I run my business, how I do my personal finance, how those two stay separate, but also connect with each other, uh, separate tax and tax and liability, but um, connect with each other in terms of building my wealth and just experience such greatness that I wanted to share it um, with uh, with others. So, and my, um, Monica asked the question, is the chat disabled? Um, I, it might be. Um, so use the Q&A as if you would a chat and uh, we'll take it from there. We'll use the Q&A as the um, place where we can see your questions, uh, respond back to them as we go. Um, so yeah, use the Q&A to not just ask questions, but also to interact and discuss. Um, that was my little intro there. I do have um, a disclaimer, <laughs> very similar to Christine's. The one thing I will add here is that not everybody does infinite banking the same. There are, um, it's kind of, evolved over time and you could have two infinite banking users, promoters side by side, and they might do it totally differently. That's part of why I am a bank on yourself professional. There's this book called the bank on yourself revolution written by Pamela Yellen. That's her trademark bank on yourself. That's part of why I used infinite banking in my title. I highly suggest before you're going to utilize the infinite banking concept, to find an, in, a bank on yourself professional, because that's who I worked with to set it in my first policies. That's who I trust and why I became a bank on yourself professional to make sure that I was implementing the strategy correctly. And thanks, Irene, hopefully I said that right. Um, love that we have some people that have never used infinite banking here before. Um, I think even if you never start using infinite banking, you'll find some value in today's conversation just based on some of the ways we think and how you might apply it to your own real estate investing. Same for you, Monica. Thanks for your um, letting us know that you've not used it yet, which is, I, I think, awesome. Um, maybe today you'll get to decide if it's something to look into further. Okay, here we go. I'd love to know as we get started here, what initially attracted you to real estate investing? Whether you have been a real estate investor for a month or for a year or maybe 10 years, I don't know, gosh, maybe there's some people here that have been doing it for 30, 40, 50 years. We'd love to know what initially attracted you to, uh, to real estate investing initially. Like what's your why? What were you looking for real estate investing to do for you? Passive income, love that. Absolutely, that's a big one for a lot of people. Thanks, Aroni, Hope I, hopefully I said that right. Um, I gotta start scrolling here. Financial freedom, that's huge. This is a great way, especially through the passive income to hit your freedom number, be able to leave a W-2, live life how you want, become a digital nomad, how, however you define financial freedom. Awesome, let's get one more. What attracted you to real estate investing? Could be a repeat. That's okay too. <laughs> okay, maybe not one more. I'll go ahead here. Tell me if any of these ring a bell for you and seem like, oh, we got finance. Um, pay less taxes. Love that one. Very tax efficient vehicle. Getting cash flow, appreciation of the sale, keeping up with inflation, right? I actually made a whole list here. Tell me if any of these, you know, remind you of other reasons. 
cash flow, we got that passive income in there. <clears throat> Tax breaks and deductions, depreciation, 1031 exchanges, really great stuff there. Appreciation, keep up with inflation, both appreciation of the value, the equity you build, and the rents. You can raise your rent. I know here in Cincinnati, the rent's gone up 25% over the last um, two years. Great place to be a real estate investor, <laughs> so I understand. Um, equity building, wealth creation, if you're thinking generationally, you get some tax advantages when that real estate gets passed on to the next generation that doesn't let the internal revenue service uh, take a, a cut of the wealth that you've created. Diversification. You can have all kinds of different real estate, but it can also diversify other portfolio assets that you have. If maybe you have a 401k that's in a lot of stocks and bonds you and mutual funds, you might diversify you know, your portfolio through real estate. Leverage, this is a big one. You can use other people's money to build your real estate empire. You don't have to put bring all of the money, you know, 100% of it to the table. OPM is a big deal, right? Other people's money. Some people are attracted to it because they don't like the risks of the stock market. You get a tangible asset, something real you can feel in your hands. We don't even get stock certificates anymore or bond certificates, we, it's all electronic numbers in a computer, whereas you can see the home, the apartment complex that you are investing in. It's very tangible. A lot of people like that. And then I can, with the diversification, there's also lots of adventures to go on. You can try flips if you like it. You can do long-term rentals, short-term rentals, REITs, private, you can become a private money lender. You can do syndications. There's all kinds of different ways to do real estate. So you're not stuck in one. You can actually have fun and have new experiences trying different kinds of real estate. And then impact. This is one that I feel like is not talked about enough. You're literally providing a home for someone to live in or an office for a business to work out of. And I fundamentally believe that when people have a stable place to live, to work, they, they have a great landlord, that they're going to make a bigger impact through their lives. They're going to treat their kids better. They're going to be a good, better employee. They're going to live more fully and give their gift to the world. And by providing them that stable place to live, you get to be part of that. And how cool is that, that we get to do that as real estate investors? Um, so Hopefully some of those ring some bells for you. You're like, yes, I thought about that one. Hopefully you get some good new ideas of some of the reasons you might want to continue with real estate investing or increase your real estate investing. The, um, I love this quote from Henry Ford. If I'd asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So I want you to think about, do you want a faster real estate endeavor do you, or do you want something that's going to revolutionize the real estate industry for yourself, for those around you, for what it looks like to be a real estate investor in the world? So now I get to reveal my favorite thing about real estate investors, and it's really all about your mindset. You're already thinking outside of conventional you're already, you know, the things that the big heads on the radio or on talk shows are talking about, you're already saying you're not going to listen to all of that. You're going to choose a different path. You're going to maybe choose a longer term, wiser path. You know, real estate's been around since there were houses, <laughs> you know, people have been buying houses and renting them to other people. So you get, to, you're thinking more of that long-term perspective, not just what everybody jumped on the bandwagon in the 1980s to, to become a part of. And that thinking outside of the conventional often means you want predictable, stabler creation of equity. You're not just looking to get rich quick like the conventional folks are, right? You like control. That's that tangible asset, that thing that you know you can raise the rent, you can sell when you're ready, you can have a lot more control within real estate. Um, and then you're likely smarter than average. Just to be honest, the average, you know, uh, IQ probably wouldn't get very far in real estate. It takes a, a smart brain, somebody that can crunch numbers, look at profit and loss analysis, to, you know, determine what's my ROI going to be? Is this property worth it? 
that actually takes some critical thinking skills that the average person in America hasn't been taught or doesn't care to learn. So that's part of, as a financial professional, why I love working with real estate investors. Now, I do have to tell you that we're part of the Ohio Real Estate Investors Association, and my husband went to their conference earlier in November, and I asked him when he got back from the conference, I, so I, the reason I wasn't there is I was sitting for the certified financial planner exam, and I passed it provisionally and waiting for my official pass, but I asked him, were there any certified financial planners at the conference? And he met a lot of people there, didn't meet all of them, but he met a good amount, and he said, no, there weren't. And I think that is such a disservice. Financial planning is so important for everyone. I think we need to make financial planning more accessible for the world at large, but especially for um, real estate investors. But a lot of financial planners aren't thinking like this because they want people to do more of the conventional side of things. They want to get their assets under management and sell them stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. So I think very unconventional conventionally myself. Um, I, and I, I love other people to think unconventionally. And that's part of why I think I'm going to be a, a different sort of financial professional going forward. So that's a lot of positive. I love to start with positive, I'm probably a very bad marketer. I'm supposed to do a lot of um, negative showing you the problems, <laughs> but I love to start with the positive. Keep that positive in mind, keep your optimism. But I do want to talk about my least favorite thing about real estate investors. Now, I know this isn't you. You're here. You're on this webinar. You're learning, seeking knowledge. But this is some real estate investors out there who shall not be named. And they will forget about or choose to ignore one or more of the risks of real estate. It's not, you know, risk-free. Sure, it might be a little less risky. There might be more control than other types of assets. You know, thankfully, real estate's not crypto right now, right? We're not seeing the same thing happen there, but it's not totally risk-free. So let's spend a little bit of time talking about the risks, and then I promise we'll get back to positive again. So here's some risks of real estate. It's unpredictable. You don't really know what the market's going to do. Sure, we can guess, but none of us have a crystal ball. We don't really know how much prices are going to go up, if we're going to have another bubble. Those who pretend they know don't really know. All real estate is local. So the changes that happen in a local environment, you can't, unless you're investing in tiny homes, you can't pick up that home and move it to a different location because you know a school closed or a factory closed or opened um, and your real estate changed by those dynamics. Everyone in real estate knows this one and those not in real estate, I feel like, know this one. Location, 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 very important where, where it's at. Again, you can't move it. And then there's all these increases in expenses without an increase in income that can happen, which can actually spiral into a negative cash flow. And then if that sends you in debt, that just the interest on the debt increases that negative cash flow. I get a whole list of these vacancies, problem tenants, maintenance, taxes, interest, so on and so forth. You got to be really, you know, real estate is very much a cash flow game. So, which, I mean, maybe Robert Kiyosaki made the cash flow game because you really have to be thinking about cash flow all the time to make sure that you're going positive and never negative. And then of course, lack of liquidity. You buy a property, the equity of that property is in the walls of the the property until you're able to sell it. And you might have to wait for the real estate environment to change in order to tap into that, that liquidity. And you have to either find a willing seller or buyer, or you have to find a bank willing to loan you money. And those are not always available. So it can create a lack of liquidity. And then finally, increased liability increases the chances that you could get sued by a tenant or have um, a major repair that you need. Um, there could be disasters like hurricanes, floods, that insurance might not cover all of it. You might need to bring some of your own uh, to the table for co-insurance or deductible. Um, so you've got some liability factors there. I love this quote from Billy Crystal. By the time a man is old enough or is wise enough to watch his step, he's too old to go anywhere. Part of what you have the opportunity to do now is build your wisdom 
think about the pros and the cons, the advantages and the risks so that you don't have to be too old to be a real estate investor before you're wise enough to know how to avoid some of these pitfalls. Now, these are some of the risks. There's also a couple of drawbacks. Um, one is you have to have some upfront capital. A bank's not going to give you 100% of the money. Probably even if you're working with a private money lender, they're not going to give you 100% of the money to get started. You do need to put some skin in the game. And often the more skin you put in the game, the better deals you can get, the lower interest you can get when you are taking loans. It takes some upfront capital to get going. Even if you're doing like wholesaling or you know, being a middleman between a seller and a buyer, you need to advertise, you need to pay a VA. There's, you know, things that you need to do just like any business to get it going. And then also it can be really time consuming. If anybody here owns property that you do long-term or short-term rentals with, you know that it can take a lot of your time, not just um, your cash, but also your blood, sweat, and tears. Um, so whatever you do, I want you to do it hundred percent unless you're donating blood or unless you're putting your cash into real estate. I want to come back to that. Think of your cash as your lifeblood. You wouldn't want to put all of it into real estate. You want to keep some so that you're able to get through one of these potential drawbacks or one of the risks that we talk about. And that place where your cash flow lives and breathes and moves through is what we're, we're gonna call infinite banking. And this, I, um, hopefully there's some other 80s, 90s kids in here. And you know this reference, the Captain Planet, the Planeteers, when their powers were combined, all the different people that represent the elements, they became Captain Planet. And that's really what we're talking here is real estate should not, just, I mean, sorry, infinite banking should not distract from your real estate. It should reinforce it kind of the gestalt principle, the sum of the two is greater than the, either of the parts. You know, one and one don't make two, they make three when they're really tied together and working really well together. So that's really what we're going to talk about here. Now, if you're not familiar with infinite banking, uh, it is a very specific way of using a financial asset that has been around for hundreds of years that about a hundred years ago, 50% of Americans used. And it's just become kind of unpopular since the eighties because so many people have gotten enthralled by the stock market. And if you look at the eighties and nineties, you can see why they love the stock market, but that predominant marketing message of, you know, no risk, no reward. You got to speculate to accumulate still is a dominant narrative with an American thinking and we like to push back on that and say, well, how far has that really gotten us with wages being not keeping up with inflation, with their, you know, being it's harder to find good paying jobs for people to have a struggle making rent, uh, the people that you're renting to. So we need to come back and say, well, what did we lose when we, when everybody started jumping into stocks, bonds, and mutual funds and cheerleading the stock market? So um, with all that said, um, infinite banking, and ho hopefully I don't lose anybody here, I'm going to watch the participants. It's a very strategic way of using whole life insurance. It's not your grandma's life insurance. Remember back in 100 years ago, 50% of Americans had these kinds of policies. It is actually a supercharged, modernized way of doing whole life insurance. We actually, this Friday on our podcast, Wealth Wisdom Financial Podcast, we're going to tell the history of where did infinite banking and bank on yourself come from. So if you want more details about that, go subscribe to the podcast there. Okay, so here's where infinite banking, this supercharged, um, high cash value, dividend paying, whole life insurance. I'll, I'll stop using fancy language. We're just going to call it infinite banking. Here's where it could fit with real estate. So <clears throat> first of all, a lot of realtors depend and real estate investors depend on banks. It's the place that will lend you money if you can prove that you don't really need it. We are so beholden to banks, they can stifle our use of um, real estate. They can hold us back when we can't get approved for more. They can even, if they give us more than we want, we could end up not being able to pay our debts. 
I don't think anyone wants to be chained to a banker or kissing a banker's ring in order to get money. So that's one thing we're doing here is we're reclaiming the banking function within our uh, financial lives. And then the second thing is we're going back against some of this risk. You don't need a parachute to go skydiving. You need a parachute to go skydiving twice. You don't need infinite banking to do real estate, but possibly infinite banking could help you do real estate even better. Have it more chances to do real estate, maybe even have more money that you can put into your real estate endeavors. So let's talk about some ideas and specific ways that People I work with, people I know are using infinite banking to boost up their real estate endeavors. So the first one is they save for that upfront cap capital. They know they're going to purchase property. They don't have the down payment now. So they will put money into their bank on yourself, infinite banking designed whole life policy. And that builds a cash value that they are able to leverage against to use for that down payment for that first property or to put their money into their syndication, whatever form of um, real estate they're going to do, that becomes their upfront capital. They can also hold their funds between their deals there. A lot of people, what where they save up and where they hold their funds is a savings account we all know how little interest you're getting in savings accounts. If you know the interest in your savings account, put it in the chat. I'm going to take a sip of water. Probably less than 1%, I'm guessing. This is a place that can grow more effectively than a savings account. And here's the part that sounds too good to be true. When you do take out that upfront capital to go buy the first property or the next property, you're not actually taking out your cash value. You're taking a policy loan against your cash value. So your cash value still grows as if you didn't touch it. And you're getting your funds doing two things at once. You're buying that property and it's still growing within the policy. That sounds too good to be true. There's nothing else that I've found that does this without taking a whole lot of risk. But like Christine said, what rich people do is they buy an asset, they borrow against the asset, and then they die and pass that asset on to their beneficiaries, their heirs. What you're doing with these whole life insurance policies is you're buying an asset. You're not renting, you're buying an asset. You're borrowing against that asset, and then you eventually die, and the death benefit goes to your beneficiaries, and it can it's tax-free, you know, all kinds of juicy, wonderful things there. Let's keep going with some other ideas. You can reduce your dependence on financing, and thereby the interest that you paid out, you're using your own money rather than a banker's money or a private money lender's money. It can become an emergency fund. I love using my policy as a place to store my contingency funds, my emergency funds, when the you know what hits the proverbial fan, I know I've got a reserve that I can tap into that I can count on being there, but is growing more than a savings account would. Diversification. This is an asset that you can add to your portfolio that's going to be different than stocks, bonds, mutual funds, different than real estate. It's actually the way that the life insurance company that's helping you do this, where they put their money is stuff that we as individuals don't have access to unless we happen to be billion, billionaires or millionaires and have a like multimillionaires and have a lot of money to put in, put somewhere, right? They get different kinds of assets that they can invest and grow our money with. So a very cool thing there. Protecting your heirs, there's a death benefit. Uh, liquidity is very important for estate planning, as well as how are you going to pay estate taxes just because your uh, beneficiary of your real estate gets a step up in basis. They might still have to pay property taxes. They might have to do maintenance on the property. The life insurance can provide the liquidity that they need so they don't have to do a flash sale of the real estate that they inherited. Very great thing to use in terms of estate planning wise. You're protected in case you get sued in most states. Um, the cash value is an asset that um, because it's there for widows and orphans or widowers and orphans, 
it's protected in most states. And if you get sued the and you lose, you have to pay a bunch of money. That's an asset that you get to keep in most states. Check with an attorney to see what um, is true in your state. Leverage. So not only can you leverage the cash value, but there are some banks and private money lenders that will let you assign the death benefit to them or a portion of the death benefit to them in exchange for giving you a loan. Remember, this is an asset and just like any other asset, you can use it as leverage to gain other people's money. And then the last one I've got here for you is equity harvesting. When you own uh, properties, when you have um, debts that you're paying down and then you interest rates maybe go down again. <laughs> um, who knows when that'll happen? Five, 10 months or five, 10 years from now, they go down again. You can refinance cash out to those properties and you've got a place to put the equity that you're essentially unlocking from the walls. I've been talking a lot here. I'm going to take a little bit of break. Um, can you think of any other ideas that if you had extra cash that was growing for you and would continue to grow for you at three to seven percent interest, say, what what would that do for your real estate endeavors? What other ideas can you come up with besides the list of nine that I just gave you? Remember, the more you participate in the chat, the more likely you're going to get the donation for the charity of your choice. Okay, I'm going to move along. You can still share some um, ideas in the chat. We've been talking all um, theoretical here. Let's do a case study. Before I jump into the case study, I've got a little joke for you. Imagine that you're in this forest where all of a sudden a tiger is in front of you. It's growling, snarling. You realize it's about to eat you. What do you do? The tiger is staring you down. What do you do? You stop imagining. <laughs> it's just an imaginary tiger. You're an imaginary forest. So let's stop imagining all the things that you could do with real estate and adding infinite banking to it to make it awesome, um, combining them. Let's stop imagining and talk about what this could actually look like. So here's the basic info of this case study. Oh, Christine, thank you. Uh, run. <laughs> That's a good one too. In your, in your imagination, you can run for sure. Um, so Joe and Joe, both in their mid thirties, both have their own businesses. One Joe has a real estate business. The other is, uh, has a business outside of real estate. So um, both are in totally in charge of all of their own income, figuring out where money comes from. They don't have a W-2 to go check in, you know, punch a timesheet and check out and get paid, no matter if the company makes money or not, they have to make money. And they're, they have two kids, so they also have to feed them. Um, as they're growing older, they get more and more expensive. And so they're making sure I don't want my family to sacrifice because I chose to take a non-conventional path and not just depend on a J-O-B. And their main goal is to get $20,000 per month of passive cash flow, totally passive outside of uh, the one part, uh, one partner's business, right? And that's all going to be passive through real estate syndications, short-term rentals, long-term rentals. They're not doing any of the work. Other people are doing the work like VAs, that kind of thing. And even though they have two kids, they don't really want legacy wealth. They'd give everything to charity, make their kids work for what they want. Part of the uh, growth curve of um, uh, kids is the struggle that they need, that they can go through. They can learn a lot more, become stronger individuals as they struggle on their own. So no trust fund babies wanted here. So the work that we've done together has literally been to get capital doing two things at once, like we've been talking about funding, uh, an infinite banking policy, and then using policy loans to fund real estate. And so their money's doing two things at once. They've also, as you know, real estate is tax advantage, but there's still taxes to pay. They've been able to save those taxes 
like save up to pay taxes within the a bank and yourself policy, take a policy loan to pay the internal revenue service. And yet that money's still growing. If you're familiar with opportunity costs, they're not paying any opportunity cost with the money that goes to the internal revenue service to uncle Sam, they're able to keep it themselves and have it still growing for them. Really awesome strategy. We've got lots of content about how to pay the internal revenue service without giving them a tip. And then the, they don't use hundred percent of their cash value that's available. They keep some there for contingencies, but also for dry powder. Who knows what's going to happen in the next year or two. If we do have a bubble burst, there's going to be a lot of cheap real estate to be gobbling up. I have a mentor, a really good friend who back in 2008, he had a million dollars stashed up over who knows how long in bank and yourself designed whole life policies. And when 2008 happened, there's a ton of real estate available to buy on the cheap. He was able to buy those, do some flips, do some rentals. He had a partner that did most of the work, you know, and he was just the money for it. And a few years later, he, the money that they generated, the partner was able to buy out his share of all those properties so that he could move on and do other things in about 2011, 2012. And he got, $3 million back over the course of those three years, four years or so. Can you imagine taking a million dollars and turning into $3 million in three or four years? Those kind of opportunities only come a few times in our lifetimes. We want to make sure we have the dry powder that's safe, that's growing, and that's still available for us to use. How cool is that? And then finally, one of the things I love bringing into the conversations I have with my clients is long-term thinking, not just where's the next deal, where do I want to be in five years, 10 years, but realizing when I'm 80 years old and I have these properties, they're still going to need roof repairs. They're still, or whole new roofs. They're still going to have all of those risks that, and downsides that we talked about earlier. I need to make sure I'm continuing to plan for that or to plan for my exit strategy if I don't want to be dealing with that when I'm 80, or how I might move from buy and hold into syndications, um, when is the right time to do that, all that kind of strategic thinking, I think it's really important to have an ally, a partner to do that with you. Okay, we're getting into the home stretch here, be thinking of your questions. This is my favorite part. And for my math nerd friends that are on the call, you're going to love this part. For those of you that don't love math, stick with me here. I'm going to do all the adding and subtracting for you, okay? So um, what really Joe and Joe did was buy one of the cheapest assets that you can buy. Remember, we've been talking about whole life insurance as an asset this whole time. Tell me, would you buy this asset? We're going to play a game. Would you buy this asset? So let's talk. Here's the asset value. You could pretend this is a house. You're driving around in one of your favorite neighborhoods. You see this beautiful house. You look it up on Zillow. It says $1.2 million. And you're like, this house is so great. I, I need to find out if I can purchase it. So you walk up to the door and you knock on the door. Thankfully, somebody's actually there. They come to the door and you say, I was just admiring your house. Looked it up on Zillow. Saw it's worth $1.2 million. I want to give you $32,000 down. I want 27% equity in the first year or $27,000 of equity. So basically I'm going to pay you $5,000, almost $6,000 for your home. What do you think they'd say? They'd laugh at you. They'd shut the door in your face. They would think you were nuts. You're bananas. How are you, Why would they ever sell you this $1.2 million asset for just shy of $6,000? And of course you say, well, Amanda, that's just year one. Look at year two. We got another 32 going in, but the equity goes up to 55, almost 56,000. So the difference between those, the 55 minus the 32 or the 32 minus the 55, the difference here is 4,000, right? This grew by 28,000 that year from 27 to 55, that's $28,000 of growth. You only put it, you put in 32, so it's 4,000 less. And then the next year it goes down even further, the cost, you put in 32, 
it grows by almost 32. It's like 31, 200 or something. So you only paid 1600 for that asset because if you sold it, you'd get this $87,000 back. And then the next year you put in your 82 to keep, you know, buying this asset, building your equity of this asset. You have 120, almost 122. You actually made money that year compared with how much you put in to the property to how much your equity grew, right? 21 plus 13 is 33 and some change. You grew by almost 2000. And meanwhile, your asset value, just like any good home would appreciate, is appreciating. You added $12,000 of value to that home over those four years. So what do you think? Would you buy this asset? If it was a home and you got to put in the, this amount each year, you get this amount of equity that if you decide you don't want the home anymore, you could get this back. And from year four, it just keeps getting better and better. This roughly $10,000 of cost in the first year, you get all of that back within 10 years. So you know how when you buy a uh, property and you use a mortgage, right? You put in 32,000, you got a 1.1 million plus loan. You're going to pay a lot more than $10,000 in interest to the bank that you purchased it from. I'm seeing a yes. Um yesterday. <laughs> Love that, Monica. Right? Like who, who wouldn't want to buy this asset knowing you put in 10,000 of cost over three years, you're going to get that back by your seven, eight, maybe 10 or 11, depending on when you're starting, who you're working with, all that kind of thing. Like that seems like a really good asset. Now here's how that asset looks with, of all things, whole life insurance designed the proper way that asset becomes the death benefit. The, the amount down is what we call the premium that you would pay. The equity becomes your cash value. And this is still cost. So would you still buy that asset if it wasn't really a home, but it was a death benefit that would be left to your beneficiaries or that you could use like we talked about earlier, for leverage to help with cap um, with loans from private money lenders or banks, or that could protect you in case you get a chronic or terminal illness. There's a lot of uses for death benefits other than just estate liquidity and uh, where it would go from there. So that's my like primer on in real estate plus infinite banking with our powers combined, what that would look like. We're going to move into some Q&A and discussion. I just want to do a quick summary here as you're thinking of your questions and getting those into the uh, Q&A or into the chat. Um, we can, I think that's open now. Here's actually, this should say two key lessons. I forgot to update my PowerPoint here. <laughs> um, so one, remember why are you pursuing real estate? Too many people lose sight of this. They start just chasing more money. They forget about that it's really for financial freedom. They can stop trading time for money, right? It's really for paying less in taxes so that you get to keep more wealth rather than paying it to the Internal Revenue Service. It's really about helping you create passive income so that you're increasing the options in your life, being able to spend more time with your family, whatever you want that passive income to do for you. And with that why in mind, you can then start to ask the question, Dramatic pause as my PowerPoint tries to work with me. Here we go. How does a correctly designed infinite banking or banking yourself policy help you achieve your why? Because you don't want to do it unless it's going to actually help you achieve that why. And with what I call the X factor, not X, but ECS factor. Efficiency, the policy should help you do real estate more efficiently, that you're able to not lose opportunity costs. You're not, able, you're not getting the leakage from paying interest to banks, right? You're, you're getting more efficiency control. You don't have to go kiss the banker's ring or, um, pay whatever interest rate the private money lender says, because you need their money. You get to bring some more of your money to the table, have some more control over the deals that you're doing. If you're doing syndications, you get to get better deals because you're putting more 
into it. You, we all know that uh, syndications will have different levels, right, of uh, participation as an LP, different levels, or if you can graduate to a GP. Safety. Um, how can you do it with, and help mitigate some of those risks that we talked about earlier? That's really what I feel like infinite banking brings to the table efficiency, control, and safety, the X factor that I think all of us would want to add and increase to our real estate portfolios. So before I hand it back to uh, Christine, I want to let you know, I offer a 15 minute complimentary discovery call. And if um, I would love to chat with you or my business partner, Brandon, who's also my life partner, <laughs> um, would love to chat with you as well. You can schedule that at wealthwisdomfp for financialpartners.com slash call. Or if you just go to wealthwisdomfp.com, you can find the discovery call on any of the pages. So complimentary 15 minutes, answer your initial questions, talk about how the process goes. If you want to look into infinite banking more and decide if you want to use it or not. Um, and if you mentioned that you saw this webinar and that's part of why you scheduled, I'll send you this Banking Yourself Revolution book, the paperback version, I think is all I've got in stock. I'll send it to you um, as well. So you can keep doing your research on my favorite way to do infinite banking because Pamela's really done a great job of making sure it's done the best way for the clients, for the people that are adopting these. Now, I, and I, I could talk about this for hours and hours but I'm sure you've got some questions. Um, and uh, please go ahead and um, go in your browser, uh, start uh, sharing here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I think Christine put the link in the chat so you can go check that out. Pass it back to Christine and we'll do some Q and A with the time we've got left after, I think you've got a couple things to add. Yes, awesome presentation. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, Amanda, so much really good information there. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you have any questions at all, please do uh, include it in the Q&A box and we will address it. I do have some questions for you. Um, so I personally am a client of Infinite Banking and have uh, seen the advantages around it. And the way I think about it is, you know, the question I ask myself now is how many times can I use the same pot of money? <laughs> um, you know, whereas I feel like before I used to think, okay, you know, I have $10. I'm just going to buy something for $10. Whereas now I'm like, well, what asset can I put it in where I can borrow the money from the asset to pay for something else? And there's like many ways you can do it. You can even triple dip sometimes. So things like using a policy as a loan to buy a piece of real estate and then getting a HELOC on the real estate to have access to your equity to buy something else. So that's like three times using the same capital. <laughs> so it, it can, you can be very creative with it. Um, there's many ways around, you know, utilizing that to certainly your advantage and to increase your wealth. So really, really cool. Um, strategies there with infinite banking. So um, here's a question. Uh, so I, I've actually heard this question from many people before. I've never heard or I have heard never to go with whole life insurance and to stick with term due to the high cost of premiums you're paying. How can I justify making such large annual premiums? Great. Um, very common question. Um, there were a whole slew of salespeople back in the eighties that would go door to door around America and knock on people's doors and say, do you own a whole life insurance policy? And when people would say, yes, they'd say, you're overpaying for life insurance. You need to buy term and invest the rest. And that's become one of the refrains that is repeated so many times that people believe it when it really comes down to doing the pros and cons analysis and how many people are actually doing that, not just taking someone's word for it. So I think there is a place and a time for term insurance. I'm not saying everyone needs whole life. I don't even think banking yourself is the right fit for everyone. You want to do that analysis, decide if it's right for you. And the biggest encouragement I can uh, tell you is that term insurance is like renting 
whole life insurance is like buying and you might, you know, there's reasons to rent an apartment or to rent a house, um, and more power to people that decide to do that with the right reasons and with the intentionality behind it. And there's also a lot of good reasons to buy a home and to live there and to, um, to actually build up ownership of it and more power to you. If you decide to do that and you've got intentionally intentionality behind it, my biggest thing is bring that intentionality to the table. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, we've got a great question from Aroni, uh, similar. So recently was advised to get term and convert it to whole life with a similar banking intent in the future. Can you speak to this? Yeah, we often do this. There are certain companies that offer convertible term where you can rent it for a time with the option to convert it to whole life later. You And we that's often when people aren't ready to do an infinite banking strategy. They'll start with term to guarantee their insurability until they're ready because then you can get the medical exam done, um, get approved for it based on your current health, and then you don't have to do it again when you're doing the conversion. My biggest thing is to be careful with that. Not all companies are created equal. Not all convertible term converts to a true bank on yourself designed whole life policy. So make sure you're working with a bank on yourself professional to make sure you get the right convertible term for that. Awesome. Um, so what does the process look like to start a policy? Yeah, so you get what I like to call a financial ally in terms of your financial professional who will spend, they should not all do this as part of why, you know, people can do things a little differently and call it the same. In my opinion, uh, and what I've seen be the best for the people I work with, and I've seen when people don't do this, things go horribly wrong. They should spend a lot of time with you to get to know what are your goals? What are your concerns? How do you think about money? What do you want your money to do for you? Where is your money currently at? And how can you chart the path to put your money more aligned with where you want it to go? And that's often two meetings of getting to know you and then putting together the strategy and seeing it be this holistic financial strategy, not just selling you a policy. So make sure you're getting that whenever you're looking into this. Yeah, absolutely. It's It has to be goal-based and has to fit with your long-term goals. That is very important. Um, so we've mentioned a little bit about taxes. Are there tax benefits and shelters around a policy? Yeah, so under current law, laws are always subject to change. And maybe I'll talk a little bit about the last time the laws around this change. Uh, but under current law, the cash value grows tax deferred. You don't get a 1099 every year. You can um, see it grow and not have to pay taxes as it grows. And policy loans are loans. Loans are not taxable. So you can use the policy when and how you want to via policy loan without paying any taxes. And then of course the death benefit is also tax-free to your beneficiaries. So a lot of good yummy tax advantages there, as well as kind of what we talked about earlier, the taxes you do owe you can put those into a policy, take a policy loan to pay the internal revenue service and not lose the growth because they still continue to grow as if you didn't take them out because you didn't, they're still there. And then the last time they changed the laws, um, they made a really big change back in 1986 that went into effect in 1987 or could have been 87 to 88, something like that. And all of the policies that were issued before then stayed under the old tax law. So we're anticipating, even if they do start new tax laws related to life insurance, that they let current policy stand or the current law, and they wouldn't um, have to adjust. But also remember, tons of Congress people, tons of internal revenue service agents, even when the president released his financial statements, he showed he owned three of these types of policies. I don't think they're going to change the tax ramifications for themselves. That's, That's personal great. opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so we've got a question here from Sandeep. Are these plans favorable for people who are uh, nearing 50 or over 50 years old? Yes. I love working with older people. Um, actually, when I was just a lowly business owner in a different industry, I introduced my mom 
when she was 63, 64 to my bank and yourself professional, she started a policy. I'm super thankful to this day that she has that. And we're able to do some family banking with it. Actually, the average uh, age when people start these types of policies is in their forties and fifties. So you're in prime time to get one of these policies started. But I will say those that are younger, those that are older, never count yourself out. We've worked 18 and younger. Um, my, I, we started a policy for my son when he was three months old, um, but 18 is official when you can start all the way up to in their eighties. Awesome. Thank you. Um, okay. So in terms of policy loans, how does that work? And when do I need to pay the loans off? Great question. So these are what we call mutual life insurance companies. That's a fancy way of saying they're owned by the policy holders. So when you own a policy, you're considered a, an owner of the company. We all know if you own a company, you can take loans from that company and you're in control of how you pay them, when you repay them, how much interest you charge yourself, right? And you can uh, give loans to the company, you know, all those kind of things. So what's happening is that there's this general fund, this pool of money that all of the policyholders, their premiums are going into, the life insurance company is stewarding for us with lots of heavy regulation of what they're allowed to do with those funds. And as an owner of that fund, I can take a policy loan of what of about 80 to 90% of my cash value at any time for any reason. They don't even ask what you're going to use it for. And I can also reset my payment terms, how and when I want to. I don't even have to make a loan repayment if I don't want to, because they know that eventually that loan will be repaid by the death benefit. So if I have a million dollar death benefit, I take a hundred thousand dollar policy loan, I die the next day, my family is going to get 900,000 in whatever I use that hundred thousand to buy. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. And also, you know, I've heard that you can use it as a retirement fund um, where if you're kind of, you know, getting older, you can just take the loans and actually use it to fund your life. And then you may not necessarily pay it off because then you just take it out from the death benefit. Exactly. So, yeah. It's another nice uh, retirement fund in addition to whatever other retirement funds you have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So, um, let's see. I think that's all of the questions that I have. If anyone has any others, we just have two minutes left. Oh, here we go. How do existing health issues affect the policy? Yeah. So my mom's given me permission to share this. Remember I said she started a policy in her early sixties. She had already had a stroke before she started a policy and she didn't just start a policy um, on herself. She actually took out a policy with me as the insured. So I wouldn't count yourself out for health concerns either. There are a lot of uh, health concerns that can still be insurable. A life insurance company will still consider you for coverage, but you can also have someone else be the insured, someone in your immediate family, a business partner, as long as you can, you have some kind of insurable interest, uh, they can be the insured and you, you're still the owner. So you still add the premiums. You can still use the cash value. You can even name yourself as the beneficiary to protect yourself in case that person uh, passes away prematurely. Yeah. Great question, Thomas. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so we're pretty much right at the hour. Um, so we are going to wrap up. If there are any additional questions uh, that you have or anything that comes up as you're thinking about this, please don't hesitate to reach out to Amanda. Um, and also she is graciously offering a discovery call. So please do sign up for the discovery call if you want to talk with her more about infinite banking. We have um, her contact here on this page. Also, we have our contacts as well, Christine and Margaret at noblyvest.com. Um, and if you are not already on our investor club, you know, please feel free to join us. We have um, a lot of educational materials going out to our investors as we lead with education. And also you have access to our monthly webinars, such as this one. Um, we host it every single month with different topics. And um, 
also we have deals. So we have really great deals and syndications. That's what we do. We offer um, syndication deals. Uh, you'll have access to those when you join our investor club. So please feel free to reach out to us or to join our club, uh, noblyvest.com. There is a blue button in the top right-hand corner that says invest with us with a short questionnaire. Uh, fill that out and register and you will be on our investor club. And I think Monica was the most active in the chat. So Monica, congratulations. You're the winner of the uh, donation to the charity of your choice, $100. Please let me know who I can give that to you on your behalf. Yay, Monica. Thank you so much for your engagement and to all of you for your engagement. Um, nice. Yeah. Very cool. Monica, let me know if you have a favorite anti-human trafficking organization. I know a great one. Okay. You don't know a particular one. I know a great one in Chicago, which happens to be a hub for human trafficking. If you're okay with that, I'll give it to them. They're called traffic free. Awesome. Cool. Yay. So we will, yay. We'll make a donation um, in your name. So thank you so much, Monica. And thank you, Amanda. Um, yeah. And uh, with that, Oh, I do also want to mention as part of Giving Tuesday, um, if you are on our list, you have seen that we, as Nobly Vests, are committed to um, to donating to uh, Feeding America, which is our charity of choice for this year. So um, if you are interested, you know, feel free to reach out. I'm going to put the link in the chat um, and you can join us in giving and participating in Giving Tuesday. All right. And with that, we thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for your time. And uh, we are an open door. If you have any questions about either this, you know, feel free to reach out to Amanda, or if you have any questions about real estate investing or syndications, uh, also reach out to either Margaret or myself. And we're happy to answer any questions you have. So have a wonderful night and we will talk to you soon and see you on the next webinar. All right. Thanks, everyone.